and then you can pass that image through the CNN, its convolutional neural network, and then it output a probability. And this probability basically can classify what kind of disease actually you need to uh, get into the, the problem. And the second example I want to show you is about a diabetic retinopathy. You also use deep, le deep learning algorithm for this is the eye problem published in JAMA 2016. So basically you use a CNN and trained uh, using a very large data set of retinal images. And then you can classify what kind of eye problem you have. So the bottom figure is very commonly used in medicine. It's called a, a ROC curve. And this ROC curve actually just a, a standard tool for diagnostic test. Uh, the, upper right uh, the upper left corner right here would be the ideal point. So the closer this, this curve bent toward to this corner, the better your test is. Because this vertical line, this y-axis is called sensitivity and the x-axis is one minus specificity. So basically this is true positive and this is a, a false negative. So basically you want your points as close as to the upper left corner. And also the compared the AI results with uh, several uh, eye doctors, the eye doctors results are actually using the, uh, the color, uh, the, the color dots. And you can see that AI results are very comparable to the uh, real doctors. The third example I want to show you is about the dermatologist level classification of skin cancer. Again, this is using a CNN network. First, the network is trained on very large a uh, data set called ImageNet with 1.28 million images. This image is just a, not, not clinical image. This is just a, like dogs, cats, those uh, uh, objects that we see in the daily, life, day, daily lives. And then after they train this CNN, they will take this trained model, it's called transfer learning, and then retrain it using the data set of, of the clinical images. And this clinical image is, is uh, contains over 2000 different uh, classifications of disease. So basically you have skin cancer and there are many different types of skin cancer based on the images of, of, of this uh, uh, lesion area, you try to classify what kind of disease it is. So the AI algorithm actually are changing the medical practice. You basically want to validate a deep neural network in silico using computer simulations, and then you want to validate, validate your chain model through clinical, uh, clinical trials in real world medicine. And you can see that over the past several years, the FDA approves more and more AI based algorithms. Basically, they can use CT, they can use X ray, and sometimes they use MRI. So, this is all image based uh, uh, algorithms. So now let's back to COVID-19. So imaging analysis, although they cannot give you a definitive diagnosis, as I said earlier, the standard approach for diagnosis is RT-PCR. But the combination of clinical and the radiographic findings can improve the accuracy of the diagnosis. Because the, the, the RT-PCR can only tell you it's positive or negative. But if you are positive, it doesn't tell you how bad the disease is where the lesions inside your lung. And this imaging can reveal more details about the disease. For example, in asymptomatic patients, um, you know, the, the COVID-19 pneumonia actually can show some lesions. For example, the ground, grass, ground glass opacity can progress to consolidation in a couple of weeks. And this information can be reviewed through CT images. So you combine the imaging features and clinical and the laboratory findings that can help you to early and better diagnosis of the COVID-19 pneumonia. Now I want to show you uh, some typical findings in these images. So ground glass opacity is the uh, most commonly seen lesions in, in the lung. And another one is consolidation and there are crazy paving patterns and you can see there, there are different uh, type of uh, lesions, particularly for COVID-19. Sometimes you can use these features to distinguish, to distinguish COVID-19 from other pneumonia. 
or even sometimes lung cancer. So how can we figure out the, the, the lesions for, uh, from the image? Actually, the, the paper, the radiological paper in the report, see, they often re reported all these uh, uh, lesion informations. For example, this is a typical image and uh, associated with the radiological report. And all these reports, they will tell you in detail what happened to your lung. For example, for this uh, second row, you can see it has a GGO. And for the third row, it has uh, this GGO with crazy paving appearance. So the radiological reports, the radiologists actually can describe what happened exactly to, to the lung. So we want to develop this uh, uh, AI driven system to help the doctors to better uh, diagnose uh, COVID-19. So our model is called the lesion attention deep neural network. So we, we basically incorporate uh, two tasks together. The primary task is for binary classification, either you have COVID-19 positive or negative, and the auxiliary uh, task is multiple label learning. Basically, we classify the lesions into five different types, and then we want to label each image, how many uh, lesions uh, in the image, and what kind of, uh, also what kind of uh, lesions, uh, the, for example, GGO or uh, consolidation, et cetera. And also this model is trained with two stage of uh, a training validation strategy. Stage one, we want to pre-train the model using a course data set. Basically, we want to uh, just uh, diagnose uh, COVID-19 positive or negative. And stage two, we fine tune it using our data, which is annotated both for COVID-19 positive and negative, and also the lesion labels. We have five lesion labels. So this is the architecture of our model. So you can see that the image comes from the left and it goes through these backbone networks. These backbone networks basically is well-developed networks in computer vision. And then we added several fully connect layers and in the end we output a binary binary classification for COVID-19 positive or negative and also five lesion labels. So the pre-training actually is focusing on the primary task is in this red box and then after pre-training we will fine-tune this network using the double tasks. So the two tasks will be used together for our data set. So basically our work is trying to integrate multiple data sets. The one data set that uh, we used is uh, um, a data set actually public available with uh, 349 samples of positive cases and 397 negative cases. This image is actually from the preprints uh, from January to March. And then we keep expanding this data set by collecting more positive and negative cases. Then we split the data into training, validation, and testing sets based on 60, 15, 20, 20, uh, 16, 15, 25%. The details of the data set with uh, uh, COVID-19, this is our data set right here. This is our data set we use. Our data set it has labels, lesion labels, but the other data sets we, we use the for pre-training actually has no lesion labels. For example, this data uh, published in, uh, in the journal cell, they have uh, only positive and negative cases, but they don't have the lesion labels. And the, uh, another data set also have no lesion labels. So we want to use the two data sets for the pre-training, and then we will apply our data set for fine tuning in the end. So this is a description of the positive and negative samples. So the first uh, histogram, you can see that, that basically give you the, the number of samples that has one label, two labels, or three labels. So you can see that most of samples has one label. And this bottom pair matrix, it show you that, uh, shows you that the frequency of two lesions appear together in one sample. So for example, the GGO and the consolidation often appear together. That's very common on one image. And the, the right figure shows you the negative cases. So they are non-COVID-19 patients. They could be other pneumonia, could be lung cancer, could be 
just a normal healthy individual CT scans. So now I want to introduce the backbone uh, network. We use the several, actually five different networks. Uh, one is VGGNet, which is developed by University of Oxford. So basically this VGGNet is being inserted as this convolutionary network. And another network popular one is called DenseNet. And also we replace this part by a dense net. And we also try the efficient net um, using different uh, number of hidden layers. So in the end, to suit our purpose, we have a primary task, we have auxiliary task. So one branch goes to binary classification and the other branch of the output goes to this multi-label task. So basically we added uh, several fully connect layer to suit our purpose. So this is the result of our neural network. So I only show you the sensitivity and accuracy. The definition of sensitivity is given here. So in statistics, sensitivity is basically the probability of being test positive given you have disease. So given you have disease, what is the probability of, of you show is, is positive? So that's the sensitivity. And the accuracy, basically the definition is here, basically two positive plus two negative divided by uh, the total number. So you can see that the backbone net, we tried VGG, ResNet, DenseNet, efficient net. And uh, the baseline model basically is a model without auxiliary task, without a multi-label learning task. So you only look at the binary classification. And we also look at pre-trained and non-pre-trained. So in the end, you see that the number I labeled in red give you the, the highest sensitivity and the highest accuracy. So basically you need to pre-train your model and also you need uh, the, the auxiliary and the primary task to be learned simultaneously. That can improve the accuracy. Also, we show you this ROC curve and also we compare our result with a real radiologist result. You can see our ROC curve is, is bent towards to this corner. This is the ideal point. You have two positive read is one and the false positive read is zero. And you can see the two triangles, one is the junior radiologist, the other is the senior. And clearly this, this, di this diamond red color is our model. So the results are very comparable to this uh, senior radiologist. And the AUC is uh, 95%. We further explored uh, this called lesion attention map. You can see that the, the left column actually is the input. And, and you can see the green box here. For each image, there's green box. Those green box is trying to circle out the lesion area. And the second column, the third column, B and C are baseline model. Baseline model, basically, you don't have this lesion attention mechanism in the model, you just do uh, binary classification of po positive or negative COVID-19 directly. And the model we used is called the lesion attention deep neural network is in column D and E. You can see that the attention actually being really paid towards the, uh, the, the, the circled area in, in the green box. So basically the model is, is similar to a real radiologist. You know, one radiologist take a, a image he or she would pay more attention to the disease lesion area in order to have a better diagnosis instead of just look at a other area without the lesion. So that's, that's why we, we believe lesion attention actually make a big difference here. We further analyze the five lesions. Um, and basically, as you remember, we have this primary task, which is binary classification. We have auxiliary task is multi-label learning uh, for the lesions. And so in this plot, we show you that for five different lesions here, and uh, you can see that the GGO actually uh, cannot distinguish COVID-19 or non-COVID-19 because the, the distribution actually overlap together on top of each other. But the other four lesions, you can see that the orange color is COVID-19 positive, uh, COVID-19, and the, the green one is non-COVID-19. So you can see that the other distribution actually can be separated out pretty well. 
So now I want to move on to the uh, second work. It basically, we want to do more than just the diagnosis. Instead of just the giving the information is positive or negative, we want, we want to show you prognosis with the, this called a graphical convolution network. The CT image actually contains, uh, you know, a set of CT image contains hundreds of uh, images, slice, slices. And all these slices have this uh, sequential structure. It's like a movie. You can imagine it's, it's like a video and it goes through the long and every uh, image is, is uh, very uh, adjacent to the next image. And so the structure are highly correlated. So we can uh, use this uh, graphical convolution network to facilitate prognosis, pro prognosis information. And the prognosis can help facilitate distributing medical resources. For example, if I can triage mild and uh, severe patients, I can better use ventilator or admission to ICUs. And uh, for, for this GCN, we also propose a new distance aware pooling method, which can effectively aggregate the densely connected graphs. And the last point I want to I want uh, stress is uh, actually we can localize the most informative slices within uh, a chest CT scan because as as I said a chest CT scan could contain hundreds of slices and uh, we can identify those slices that's most relevant so that it can reduce the amount of work for radiologists the radiologists just focus focus on the on the recommended slices for, for better diagnosis, instead of looking one slice after another, you know, hundreds of them. So this is schema of the GCN. So we basically select 48 slice, slices for each patient. Actually, there are hundreds of slices. We, we, we select 48 slices. And each slice, you look at this picture, each slice in the CD scan can be converted to, to a node in a graph. So this is a graph. And so each image is will become a node here. So one patient would correspond to a densely connected graph with 48 nodes. And then we are going to do the node reduction. So in the end, we, we reduce the dimensionality. And in, at the same time, we use a distance aware pooling to pull the features together. And we can combine this uh, distance aware pooling with GCN together so that we can do the dimension reduction. So the data set we used is uh, also this, this, this paper published in Cell. And this data set contains uh, over 900 COVID-19 positive patients, over 900 common pneumonia patients, and over 800 healthy individuals. Again, we split the data into 60% uh, for training, 15% for validation, 25% for the testing. So here, uh, the true label actually contains COVID-19 positive, okay, it's called uh, this COVID-19 positive NCP. CP is common pneumonia and normal. So basically this is a uh, classification, it's not binary, it's a, it's a trinary classification and this is a confusion matrix. So basically this is the true label and this is a predicted label. And we hope that the diagonal numbers are larger the better because uh, that means the, consist the consistency between the predict predicted label and the true label. The off diagonal numbers are basically misclassifications. And on the right is a, is a severe versus mild conditions. So basically we try to classify the patients into either they are severe, they need to, uh, ventilation or um, ICU. Uh, and the, the mild condition, basically you probably don't need to to get into ventilation. So again, the confusion matrix, you expect this number to be larger the better. So we, we can conduct diagnosis as well as a prognosis. So the diagnosis result is showing uh, on the top panel of this table. So we try different methods, GCN uh, using this uh, new pooling method that right here is called distance aware pooling and an uh, existing method called adaptive structure aware pooling or called ASAP. So we compare different methods, also feature extraction methods. You can see the one that labeled in the red box basically is a accuracy, precision, 
recall. Recall actually is, is simply sens sensitivity. And I find score, all the definitions here. So all these numbers actually are between zero and one. The, the closer to one, the better, the higher, the better. And you can see that the method we proposed actually achieved very high uh, uh, values for all these four metrics. metrics. For prognosis, the number is uh, not, not as, as good as um, diagnosis because uh, actually the data set is much smaller for prognosis. So again, the method we, we use, the GCNDAP actually achieved the highest uh, values here in comparison to other methods. Another important uh, contribution of our work is uh, we can localize the most informative, informative slices for the radiologists to focus on. Right? Instead of reading 100 or 200 slices, we can narrow down to 10 or 20 slices to, for the radiologist. So basically this plot show you that the orange box, the orange box actually are located using our method. And the slice, with, the, the slice with the green stars are the ground truth. That's basically those slices contain the lesions. So you can see that we can, we, we, we may miss two slices, but we can basically locate most of the uh, informative slices. Because if you, if you look at other slices, they don't have lesions. You just give these slices to the radiologist, this is you cannot make a correct diagnosis based on other slices. So here's a, another example for the recommended CT slices. So all these slices in these uh, figures are recommended by our model. Uh, so, so the green stars are the ground truth. We recommended more, but actually we still can contain the most of the ground truth. Uh, those, those are real, real problematic slices. So we further look at uh, this uh, 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 lesion lo localization result for COVID-19 patients and also for the common pneumonia patients. So basically this table shows you that for a particular patient with a CT uh, scan, this is our method called one job localization, the start index and this add index, that's basically number 41 slice up to number 49 slice and the, choose, the ground choose also 41 to 49. But the other one, the other patient, you, you have to look at it from number 13 to 107, but the ground truth is 11 to 108. So not too far away from each other. And you can see the precision recall and this IOU is that defined as intersection over union. Basically is a localized slice intersect with a slice with lesion divided by the union of these two. So IOU also, lies between zero and one, the closer to one, the better. The, if the localized slices are exactly the same as the slices with lesion, then this IOU would be one because the intersection and the union would be the same. So it's one. So for common pneumonia, also you can see that we, we can recommend from, uh, for example, 20, 25th to 65th. And uh, the ground truth is 22nd to 60, uh, 63rd. Uh, 63, okay. And also we developed this uh, uh, COVID-19 diagnosis system. It's, it's live right now online and you can, uh, you can get to this uh, web website and uh, access to this website and upload a, a, a CT scan image and you can use it immediately. It's very fast. So this uh, system actually, uh, you can upload one chest image and it show you the result in one second or less than one second. You can also upload multiple images. For 10 images right here, you, you can see the result in less than three seconds. So you don't need to wait for hours. Once you get the image, you can immediately uh, see the result. So it's very easy to use. You can uh, go to the website, there's a test button. Once you cl uh, click the test button, there's a a window asks you to choose a file, and this file can be PNG, any image file, JPG, JPEG, and DCM file. And then once you upload it, the, the image will show appear uh, on the website and it show you the result is negative or positive. 
you can also upload uh, uh, in a batch. So basically, if uh, for one particular patient, uh, his CT scan probably uh, we choose 10 or 20 uh, images and we can zip them together in a zip file and then we can upload the zip file. And then this image will show you all this. For each image, it gives you a, 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 a one or zero. One means positive, zero is negative. Certainly, if you upload uh, for one patient, you upload, say, 10 images, and some images has lesions, some images has no lesions, and you would see one and zero, because for those no lesions, it cannot see any lesions, it will, uh, it, it will classify as non-COVID-19. So that's why it's very important to localize where are those informative slices uh, so that you can, you can make a, a, a correct diagnosis of the disease. And we, we also make uh, all codes and data are freely available. Uh, the, first, uh, the first model already published in CKDD this year, and the second paper just submitted to this uh, conference is called the International Conference Learning Representations. And all this uh, uh, code and data available in the GitHub website is keep updating. So you can go to our website and download the data and the, our model. So now I want to uh, basically talk more general about uh, the AI in medicine. So as I said, the diagnostics in radiology using X-ray, CT, or MRI images, uh, we can help to expedite the process of treatment and improve disease cure probability and life savings. But you know that all these images must be labeled by doctors. So, so the doctors play a very, very critical role. Actually, the most important role played uh, by these doctors because they need to uh, provide the, the lesion uh, diagnostic reports with all these lesion descriptions. And then we can label whether a particular image, whether it's, it's a GGO or it's a consolidation, whether it's positive or negative. So all these image must be labeled by doctors. And you can also utilize the electronic health record data using the NLP te te techniques. And, uh, but it, remember, the electronic health record also recorded by the doctors. So the doctors, again, plays very important role. If, if, if the data recorded a messy, then certainly you have messy data or, or incorrect labeled data. You, in the end, your system would, would, would be, uh, performance would be very poor. And I want to stress that AI has no creativity. So in the sense that AI cannot make sense out of what's going on. It cannot explain the mechanism of the underlying uh, structure. It, it basically, the AI system is like the, oh, in general, the machine learning is basically based on the training, uh, validation, and testing. It's basically based on prediction. And you hope your prediction is close to the ground truth. So that's basically people call it a, a black box. So this black box does not give you any explanation about the underlying mechanism. It also cannot carry out innovative work. You can see that there are some some work talk about you know uh, AI robot can. Um, conduct experiments by combining different compounds together, and uh, it can create some new uh, new compound. But he just put the compounds um, randomly because it can repeat things very fast, so, th so much faster than a human being. So, so by random uh, putting the compound together, but it cannot come up a good reason why these two things should be put together. So AI is more suitable for tedious and repetitive and redundant work. So that's why for CT images, even though you have hundreds of images all together, we can reduce the amount of work um, to, uh, to maybe 10 or 20 set of images pr presented to the radiologist to further analysis instead of wasting the radiologist's time go through hundreds of images one by one. So all those repetitive work can be uh, eliminated using AI system. But in the end, AI cannot replace or take over human being. Not like this movie Matrix. Uh, you know, basic. If you have watched this movie, actually, this is a very popular movie. It has one, two, three, and I think also have a four coming out. So basically, this movie talking about the the computer in in the end can take over human being. Actually, I don't think this 
is going to happen at all. So to summarize, um, the statistics actually is very important. I view this convolutional neural network of deep, deep learning as a statistical model. It's simply a non-parametric, very flex, flexible statistical model. And the statistic has been playing a very uh, critical role in medicine for hundreds of years. And AI now emer emerging as a supplement to medical doctors for better decision making. But there are a lot of obstacles for AI applications. For example, the privacy, the security, uh, the, the bias, and the non-robustness. Uh, sometimes uh, the, the, the AI system would draw a wrong conclusion if you twist the data a little bit. For example, image, you, you just uh, uh, damage the image a little bit, the AI system would make a wrong decision. Uh, there's a book called The Deep Medicine. So this book, very uh, very interesting. The, the, the author is Eric Topol, is a medical doctor. Is, I think he's a, cardiova a cardiovascular medical doctor. So he said, AI actually can make healthcare human again. So he said, the biggest change is the gift of time can get back to patient-doctor relationship. So AI can reduce the amount of doctor's work. So doctor can go back to uh, uh, to the patient, more communication between doctor and patients. So finally, I want to acknowledge uh, the team who have uh, I have worked with. One is my former postdoc, uh, Dr. Liu Bin, uh, and that's his students uh, in Southwest University of Finance and Economics. And this is the Hong Kong U team. So that's that's the uh, students who are working with me right now. And this is uh, Dr. Liu Bin. Uh, and finally, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I hope you um, understand uh, my talk. And if you have any question, I would, I would like to uh, uh, ask uh, any question from the audience. Is there any questions? You just feel free to unmute yourself and ask. And um, is um, are there two questions from Justin? Hello. Yes. Please. Uh, may I ask a question? Why? Why AI and ego uh, diagnosis and prognosis is better than the traditional reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction? Oh, you mean why the the, the CT image is better than the? Uh, many patients. Will... Yes, go ahead. Okay, if I understand your question correctly. As, as you see here, first, you, 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 you actually, you, you know that a lot of patients, they show negative for RT-PCR test. They negative, negative, and all of a sudden it's become positive. So the PCR test, the sensitivity is not high enough, particularly for early diagnosis, because the, this test actually is, it depends on um, the, the intensity of the coronavirus, uh, because you need, you need to take a swap either from the nose or throat and then you go through the laboratory test. And the, the sensitivity of this test may not be high enough, particularly for early diagnosis of the patients. And also for those patients that have no symptoms. And, and also this, I'm not saying CT is better, but CT actually uh, is in terms of diagnosis, I'm not saying it's better, but it's a supplement to this test. And also CT can reveal more information other than just the diagnosis. It can give you what exactly happened to your lung. You can see the lesions, for example, GOO consolidation and all other type of lesions. And it, it can tell you how serious the disease become. And also it can monitor if you take a drug. For example, uh, you, you know, Donald Trump took the drug Red Misphere. If you take the drug, it can show whether the drug improved the lung condition. 
over time. But the, C, the, the test only give you positive or negative. That's all it can, can do. But CT can give you much more information uh, than, than the test alone. Okay, any other questions? Um, there's a question from Justin, and then he asked about how could you deal with the label imbalance problem? Label imbalance problem. Actually, we, uh, okay, let me show you this data set. Actually, we, we, we didn't encounter this problem. We didn't even think about this uh, label imbalance. So, you know, for this uh, data set, the pre-training data set, this, this Jiang et al. published in Cell, it has very, very, this is very large data set, over 300,000 images. But we actually, we didn't use all the images because our own data set, we, for, e, for, each, for each image, for each COVID-19 positive image, we handcraft labeled those lesions. Those lesions are labeled by us because we, we gone through this uh, radiological reports and then we, we figure out those uh, lesions and we label them. But for this image, there's no radiological reports. We cannot label them. So, so we, 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 we didn't use all the data uh, in, in this paper. We used, uh, to make it comparable, we only used uh, a, a subset of the data set of, the, of this one. And also, uh, we try not to use too many images from one patient because one patient actually have, have hundreds of images, hundreds of slices of the uh, long image. We, we try not to use all of them. Uh, so we, we, we reduce that uh, data set act actually a lot. And this one actually is much smaller. We use it all. We use all the data set in this one at all. And both these two data sets are not labeled in terms of lesions. Only our data set are, are labeled. Okay, not, any other question? I, I, I can see chat, I can, I can see some questions. Yeah, there's a question from Shu Wang. Oh, there, there are too many questions. Probably. I mean, he just wrote down to the bottom and then there's oh. two more questions from Shu Wang and also Eva. Uh, Eva, okay, maybe I, I, I answer Eva's question first. Which software are you used to extract the image features? Uh, we use uh, PyTorch and, and, and also for uh, GCN, actually we, uh, we use two different uh, methods. One is Wavelet, the other is the Inception version three to extract those features. And another question is uh, for your second part, the schema of GCN. I'm curious about uh, why you convert each slice in the CT scan to a node or graph maybe we can just regard each slice as one training sample. Okay, as I said earlier, okay, I, I, uh, as I didn't finish reading your question, but I, I basically, as I said earlier, the CT scan is like a video. You should more look at, uh, like a video because every slice is, is, is very close to each other. It's just take, take a one, one slice of image of, of long cross-sectionally and there, there could be hundreds of images be, being taken. And uh, you, if you treat this like a big uh, tensor or, or a big video, uh, you, you know that each slice actually are highly correlated, highly correlated uh, with, with each other. So that uh, if you treat them uh, as one sample, actually you would uh, encounter uh, highly correlated data that, that's not, not Good. So we basically convert this image into the node and then we do node reduction in the end that can give a more efficient uh, result. Um, there's uh, one more question from Mr. Um, Li Dan Tong. And then um, he asked about like, um, he wants to know if there's any other researcher around the world are doing similar research or research in related work. And at what stage are they? Um, do you have any like um, information regarding this? Okay, so how is the related work of other, others? Um, actually, if you go to Meta Archive or Bio Archive, there, there, there are so many papers uh, being posted every day. 
and th there are people using x-ray there are people using ct scans uh, doing the ai diagnosis uh, we are not uh, the only group actually in the world there 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 are many other researchers are conducting similar research uh, research but i believe we are the group using the legion legion information uh, and uh, we also here is the background noise. Okay, any other questions? May I ask one more question? Yes. Uh, uh, the the bird routine examinations is another thing that I have heard uh, requested by the patients. Uh, Can you say that again? I didn't the, hear. The, the bird routine examination to check the amounts of uh, things like uh, rice blood cell, red blood cell, hemoglobin, and other like- Oh, the blood cell, hemoglobin. okay. The blood routine examination, yeah. Yes, blood yes. Blood. Uh, have you incorporated this kind of information into no. your analysis? No, we don't have this information. So we cannot, if we have this information, we certainly will be happy to use it, but if we don't have this information. You see, because uh, the data says, uh, um, is uh, is missing this this data? Yeah, we don't have this data. The the data set we use the all published data set, and the data set also we we the data set we collected also also published on the GitHub. So all these data set available, but they don't have this blood uh, examination data. Thank you. I had a question. Hello, um, Professor. Yes. Uh, well, I'm Justin. Uh, may I ask you one question? Sure. Like, uh, you mentioned that the disease labeling uh, at the moment for for the uh, electronic uh, for for all the electronic dialog diagnosis actually relies heavily on the doctor's output. But so far, like as I know, some disease, especially for the chronic diseases, might have a very opaque definitions. Uh, like some of the definitions are uh, highly unclear. So that yes. So you could expect that the, the AI trained based on their labeling in, in these cases could be highly noisy or yes. biased. Yes. Do you think that AI at the moment could address such a problem? For example, that the algorithm could find a better definition uh, to, to certain disease? No, I don't think so. I, you know, what I think is this, uh, AI can learn much faster than human being. Uh, for example, you know, our model, we can train it just in a couple of days. But if you train a radiologist, a, a medical doctor, it needs years of years of studying and uh, training to, to have a very good doctor. I, I believe AI, eventually, um, the AI system really rely upon the data it receives. Uh, uh, and the data actually come from the medical doctors. Um, in the end, you know, the, the AI system probably can, uh, can be better than junior radiologists. Remember, I have a plot I have plot right here you know the junior radiologist actually indeed not performing as well as the senior radiologist but the, you see the AI actually can beat this junior radiologist but it's very comparable to to, to the experienced ones so I believe AI cannot beat the best doctors in the world but uh, it can achieve very high performance result in comparison with uh, you know medical residents and uh, the, the entry level doctors but, but i think uh, in the end uh, the ai system really relies upon the quality of the data if, if the data itself is noisy of course the ai system would 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 not be able to 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 help with those kind of problems and we have one final question from Alicia Lam, and she wants to know if machine learning is incorporated to help with the development of this model uh, you repeat again, uh, has machine learning what? Machine learning is incorporated to help with the development of this model. Of course, uh, uh, this question is, is, is too general. general. Uh, we use the deep, deep neural network and deep neural network is a part of machine learning. So machine learning is, is very broad uh, concept. It, it includes, um, for example, a support vector machine, uh, clustering, uh, classification, all those uh, can, uh, uh, by, like uh, the tree, uh, decision trees, all these uh, can be classified called machine learning uh, techniques. 
uh, deep learning is uh, is one particular type of machine learning uh, approach. Of course, our two uh, methods proposed here both depend on the deep neural network. The other is actually is a graphical neural network. Hi, Professor. Hi. I have yes. A question. Yeah. Um, is there good evidence to support that uh, this radiology image enables early diagnosis better than uh, RT PCR? Uh, compared to RT PCR, I mean, yes, early yes. Diagnosis. Yeah. Y yes, you are right. Uh, in the literature, in, 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 in some papers in the literature, like radiology, uh, the journal radiology, they're, they're, their paper talking about for early diagnosis, the CT scan actually can perform better. There are such, uh, such papers published supporting the, the, the claim you just said. Y oh. Oh yes, but the the practical, uh, the the real issue may be the the patients only go to the hospital to get the CT when it's quite, uh, when the situation is quite severe or when it's diagnosis and have well, has some symptoms, right? Yeah, yeah, you are right. You know, um, so 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 what I'm trying to. Uh, uh, promote here is not, it's not just for diagnosis. Uh, I also want to uh, talk about the pr prognosis, right? So, so you are you are right in the sense that um, only the patient once once they have the symptom, they would go to the uh, hospital and to get checked out. But uh, when, once you are in the hospital, look at uh, Donald Trump. He also received the X-ray and the CT scans because all these things can help you. You you know. You have to look at your lung. You, if you don't look at the image, you don't know exactly what's going on inside your lung. It, it's just like MRI or X-ray. You, you have to. You cannot see through your legs, right? You, for the knee disorders, you got to have MRI, and so that you can see what happened, how it's twisted, how the bone and, and those linkage being uh, distorted. And the same thing is true for lung and for the brain tumor. For example. This image is a very, very important in medicine because if, if somebody got a, a tumor in the lung, before I open, it, open the, the, the chest up, you got to know where the tumor is. And how can you know where the tumor? You have, uh, to, you have to get the image first, right? Then you, you got to find the tumor and then take it out, uh, do the surgery and, and take it out. So the imaging actually provided much richer information than just the give you the positive and negative COVID-19 diagnosis. Yeah, I, I, yes, yeah. Prognosis, very, uh, look at prognosis, very meaningful. Thank yeah. you. And another information I, I, I will try to stress here is uh, the, the AI system actually can eliminate many, many use, useless images in the CT scan. CT scan is just not just one image. CT scan has hundreds and hundreds of images. And many of the, those images have, are useless. If you look at those images, that you think this this is a, a healthy individual, but you got to find those images that has a problem, has a disease lesion. And by using this AI system, it can quickly eliminate all those uh, images without lesion and only focus in, on 10 or 20 images and pass it pass it on to the real radiologist that for further check. So this is why I say AI system can reduce the uh, amount of tedious work. A and uh, so let the doctor to focus on more on those uh, useful information instead of looking, go through all these uh, hundreds of images one by one. Um, thank you. So as time is running out, so um, I will take one final question. So I saw Kay Ng previously wants to ask a question. So do you still want to ask the question? Oh, uh, yes. Um, I want to ask, like, as the result of your program, is that very significant? And what's the next step or the challenge for this method to be routinely used in clinical settings? Oh, the most uh, challenging for this, uh, actually, frankly speaking, you know, we, we, we send, a, 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 you know, a version of the, the, the paper to a journal and it got revised. And in the end, uh, they add a new re reviewer. The reviewer basically said, um, you, you know, the standard 
approach for diagnosis is uh, RT-PCR. Uh, CT scan is not, uh, is, is not used. And so they rejected our paper. Um, so you, you are right, you know, the, the current standard, the, the gold standard is uh, this uh, RT-PCR test. Uh, so the, the major challenge for this uh, uh, AI system to be used is uh, we need to uh, collaborate with uh, doctors, radiologists, so that the, this system can be implemented routinely uh, for this, this work actually not only for COVID-19, it can be used for other pneumonia. So for example, in, in our second part of the talk, we talk about there are other type of pneumonia and even lung cancer can be classified. Right? All these things actually can be automatically, um, how it, it, it doesn't replace radiologists in the end. So I don't think the radiologists need to worry about their job because they are the most important people. They, they would help label uh, the image. And uh, actually this system is trying to help them uh, to focus more on those uh, important images instead of looking everywhere. Uh, and also uh, by, as I said earlier, uh, such a system actually can be trained uh, in a couple of days. Um, and the model would learn uh, very, very fast. Uh, but for a real doctor, it, it just take uh, years of years of training to reach that level. Um, and another uh, example, you can think that uh, for lawyer, you know, you know the, the law documents actually is, is hundreds of pages. And the, because there are a lot of redundant uh, text in the law, uh, in, in the legal documents. So if you have this uh, NLP technique, you can go through these legal documents quickly and only, uh, only extract those information that's mostly critical. So you, you can reduce the amount of time that a lawyer spend to, re, to go through the documents. So a lot of things can, can, can be done to help uh, the experts, the domain, domain knowledge experts to reduce their amount of work instead of replace them. Actually, this is helping them rather than replace them. Right. Thank you, Professor Yin, and thank you all for joining the online lecture today. So I think this is a very fruitful discussion. So um, in this time, like under the COVID-19, please also take care and stay well. So thank you all and goodbye. Yeah, thank you very much. I think you can check that website and you can upload, if you have a CT image, you can go ahead and upload the image and to see uh, how it comes. All right, thank you. Good night. Thank you again. Bye-bye.